want to spend some time in God's Word. All right, so worship team, thank you so much. God bless. Um, I'm going to ask you as you take your seats to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Um, and there's a word that I really, really do believe that God has been, well, he's put on my heart, but he's really been working in my life also. I want to ask you just to keep Pastor Paul and Sister Vicky in prayer. They're over in Sweden today. We know we have some good friends from a ministry in Sweden because over there in Stockholm is pretty much, I believe at the moment, the murder capital of Europe when it comes to gangs and violence. And they've been invited in there. There's a special conference and they're speaking. So please keep them in prayer. Uh, please also keep my wife in prayer. She's had to head to Bristol to um, say goodbye to a family member who's about to go and be with the Lord. Um, so please keep her in prayer also. This has been an interesting week, to say the least. We're carrying on the unseen realm, and I felt like calling today's message the unseen message and just worshipping and not speaking, because it's been a challenging week, a really challenging week. But you know what? God is good through it all, in it all. And you know what? I wouldn't have it any, well, I would have it any other way, but I, would, I just want it God's way. Um, part of me wants to say it another way, but I want it God's way ultimately. Hebrews chapter 13, the title of today's message is called The Unseen Footprints. And it says this in Hebrews 13, 7 to 8. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. How many of us can thank God that he's unchanging? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have had so many opportunities to celebrate, so many opportunities to stand before you with lifted hands, worshipping, praising, celebrating. But right now in this moment, our worship is with lifted hearts to you. Speak to us through your word. Lord, let it go beyond emotion, let it go beyond experience, and let it ultimately be your reality in our life. Lord, we thank you today. We give you the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of the most infamous passages in the Bible. You know, I'm an 80s kid. Well, if I say I'm an 80s kid, it kind of means I grew up in the 90s, right? And before Spotify, before streaming, before downloading, you had something called Top of the Pops. Right? How many people remember Top of the Pops, right? So I remember I used to sit in my room and I used to listen to the Top 40 on a Sunday afternoon listening to who, who would come in the top 40, who would come in the top 30, but you were always waiting for the top 10. You were waiting for those songs that everyone knew. You were waiting for those songs that everyone was singing, everyone was making noise about. See, I kind of liked a lot of different music. I wasn't a one type of music guy. But some of the groups I used to listen to in the 90s was Blur, The Lighthouse Family, Tony Rich Project, Prodigy, forgive me. Right, it was a lot of different groups I listened to. There was one boy band you're allowed to like as a young guy, you got a freebie, and that was the Backstreet Boys. You're allowed to like them. Not boys though, not any of them, you're allowed to like the Backstreet Boys. Boys to men as well, right? These were the types of music I would listen to, and you would always be waiting for to see which one had made it number one. You know, when I think about this statement, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever, that's like one of the top 10 scriptures we use in church, right? There's certain passages or certain scriptures you will hear every preacher use, every Christian use, certain passages like this, greater is he who's living in me than he who is in the world, right? If God is for me, then who can be against me? No weapon formed against me, right? We use these passages and we say them, right? God works all things out. Okay, right? These are the passages we use. But, you know, sometimes we become so familiar with passages that we think we know what they mean. But when we actually get into it, we realize there's a lot more that God's saying than we even first realized. One of the famous ones we'll look at later is God's promises are... You know, that's not what it says. But we'll get to that in a minute. But when we say that God is unchanging, when, some of you are already going to that scripture trying to find it now on Google. We'll get to it. When, you, when we say God is unchanging, when the Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what does it really mean? I want to point to three things. We're not going to take too long today. If 
famous last words of every preacher. But we're going to look at three things. I want to point us towards three things that are unchanging about God. His presence, his promises, and his power. His presence, his promises, and his power. The first one, God's presence is unchanging. He says throughout scripture, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's two different places in particular I want to mention briefly. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, Israel about to enter the promised land. They're about to enter this land after coming out of slavery, coming out of bondage, and they're about to enter a place where God was going to be with them, but they were going to have challenges. And God says this, be strong and bold. In Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, be strong and bold. Have no fear or dread of them, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never fail you, nor will he forsake you. You know, this passage makes a lot of sense. If you're about to go into a place that you've never been, if you're about to face challenges that you've never faced, if you believe that God has not finished with your life, then you know you need him to be with you, that he journeys with you. Israel was about to enter a place where there was going to be enemies waiting for them. There were cities to be taken. There was families to be established. And God reminds them as they're about to step in, he says, Israel, and he can say to you and I today, Vicharish Manchester, I will never fail you, nor will I forsake you. That makes a lot of sense. But then he also says this in Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So our relationship with money is based on our faith in Jesus. Um, it amazes me, because when I read it, I was like, I don't think that's meant to go there. <laughs> Keep your life free from the love of money, because he's, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But he's teaching us that all that truly matters, above all else in this life, is his presence. It's intimacy with God. Whether, thing, whether you gain or you lose, whether you get a promotion, a pay rise, or you're going through difficult times in work, what matters is that his presence is with you. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content, be grateful for what you have because he will never leave you nor forsake you. You can lose everything material in this life, but he will never leave you nor forsake you. His presence is what matters. David says this in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. You know, that psalm's a beautiful psalm. But I want to focus for a moment on this verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I want to do a little illustration. I'm going to ask the three people to come up for a moment. we do a little illustration. It's not, don't worry, not going to get anyone involved. You can just be right down here. Well, three more, yep, yeah, there you go. So we're going to do this. We're going to do a quick illustration. I want to show you how it is that many of us live our lives for God if we're not careful. And so I'm going to ask you, Victoria, if you can go to the back for a moment, all right? And then goodness and mercy. So this is what we're going to do for a moment. John is goodness and mercy, all right? He is goodness and mercy. Jason is Jason, all right? Prepare yourself for the part. And Victoria, with all due respect and honor and reverence to God, is God in this illustration. So you have goodness and mercy. You have Jason, which represents each and every one of us, and you have God. Now, David says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
Goodness and mercy represents provision and blessing and breakthrough. Goodness and mercy represents, it might represent healing or financial provision, whatever it might be. Goodness and mercy represents the provision and the blessing of God. But David said, goodness and mercy follows me. This is how we live as Christians sometimes. Goodness and mercy begins to move and begins to walk and then we begin to follow. And he begins to move around and all of a sudden our eyes are fixed on goodness and mercy. Our eyes are fixed on breakthrough. Our eyes are fixed on healing. But guess what? He's chasing the healing so much that he's further away from God than when he began with. And so God hasn't been moved anywhere else. God's got him exactly where he wants him. But all of a sudden he's following goodness. He's following mercy. He's following breakthrough. He's following healing. And all of a sudden he turns around and where's God? God's not moved. God's not changed his position. But he's been following the, what he's looking at. He's following the healing. He's following the breakthrough. He's following all of those things instead of following God. And the truth of our Christian life is you can become so obsessed with a healing. You become so obsessed with a breakthrough that you end up moving away from God. And we end up worshipping what it is that we believe God wants to give us instead of worshipping God himself. But when you switch it around, goodness and mercy goes to the back and God goes to the front. Right? Where you go? Well, where you go? Now you begin to follow and God begins to lead and God begins to move and God begins to do something. And every time Jason looks around, every time Jason turns around, what's behind him? Goodness and mercy, blessing, provision, peace, joy, breakthrough, promotion, whatever God wanted for you, because God is leading, goodness and mercy is with him. But when you get it the wrong way round, my gosh, my gosh, and even when God leads you in places you weren't expecting, you turn around on what's behind you, goodness and mercy. Can we put our hands together for our volunteers? Especially our hands together for God, right? But you know it's so easy. It's so easy, church, to fix our eyes on what we think we need. And in the process, when God begins to move in a certain way, we miss it. Because our eyes are fixed on the blessings and mercy, the goodness. And we're looking at his hands instead of looking at his heart and his will and his purpose for our lives. Jeremiah had a vision that was given to him by God in Jeremiah 18. A kind of infamous one about the potter's wheel. And I want to read just a couple of verses and it says this. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah was given a vision by God. And that vision represented what God had been doing with Israel. And it can speak to you and I today of what God does in your life and my life. And we get put on the potter's wheel. Let's be honest today. The Christian life is like being on the potter's wheel many times. That we are getting shaped and formed. And what's beautiful about this passage is that God's hands never left the potter's wheel. Even when things have been difficult, even when Israel have made mistakes, God was still shaping and forming them. But you know what the challenge is many times? Is that we step off the potter's wheel and we put God on it. We put God on the potter's wheel many times, or we try to in our lives. And we say, God, I want you to be like this. And we begin to fashion and shape God in our own image. Well, I want God to be like this. I was taught God was like that. And all of a sudden, our lives are shaped not by us being on the potter's wheel and God shaping us and forming us for his glory, but we try to put him on the wheel and begin to shape him and form him based on our cultures or our experiences or our setbacks or our comfort zones or our compromises. And we try to replace that situation. And we say, God, I'm going to shape you in the way that I want you to be. And the Christian life is many times that choice of who, who are we going to put on the potter's wheel? 
Are we going to stay on it and let God shape us and form us in his presence for his glory? Or are we going to try and put him on the potter's wheel? You know, many times in my PhD studies, one of the things that I'm studying about is the wrath of God. About God's judgment and across the whole church right now in the world, there's many people that want to say, you know what? Wrath is unbefitting of God. That he shouldn't judge and he shouldn't do this and he shouldn't do that. And the church is in danger of trying to shape a God that's comfortable for them. Instead of allowing God to shape you for his honor and his glory. Because when you allow him to shape you, you will turn around and guess what will be right behind you? Goodness and mercy. That's why David can say that psalm, though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not fear. Why? Because I know God's going to give me what I want. No, I will not fear because he will be with me. Intimacy with God, his presence is unchanging. No matter what valley or mountain, no matter what situation, his presence is unchanging in your life and my life. The second thing that is unchanging is his promises. You see, when you spend time in his presence, you become familiar with his promises. When Israel cried out in Egypt, when they were going through their slavery, it says that God remembered them. That doesn't mean that God had forgotten them. What it means is that God was reminding them that he was going to fulfill every promise that he had made to them. God was thinking and remembering about every promise he had made to his people. And there's a scripture I want us to look at, 2 Corinthians 1.20. The promises of God are, but it says this, For in him, being Christ, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say amen to the glory of God. You see, when you say the scripture, for God's promises are yes and amen, that makes it seem like you have no responsibility in it. But this scripture doesn't say God's promises are yes and amen. It says God's promises in Christ are yes, but your responsibility and my responsibility is to say amen in response to God's promises. And that doesn't just mean the simple amen at the end of a prayer. Amen means let it be so. Let it come to pass. So what the scripture is really saying is that when you become familiar with the promises of God, it is your responsibility to align yourself with God's promises so that each and every one of them comes to pass. Now listen, I'm not talking about no prosperity gospel, so to speak, where we just name it and claim it or we see something, we say, I want that. God's promises are yes and amen, so I'm going to take it. But you know, just as dangerous as a prosperity gospel is a poverty gospel, where we fall short of, of, of receiving everything God has for us because we're waiting God to, for God to do all the work when God says, every promise is yes in Christ. I've given you the cross. I've given you my word. I've given you the church. I've given you faith. I've given you gifts. I've given you my spirit. So your responsibility now is not just to sit back and say, God, just do whatever you want to do you see there's a problem sometimes in church this is like a medicine message there's a problem sometimes in church where we think that God is just going to do all the work and we sit back and wait now don't get me wrong it's grace it's his power it's all him there's an old saying that says without God you can't and without you he won't he works through people but yet the amen is so rarely spoken by us because we're waiting for him to do it first before we'll worship, before we'll praise, before we'll submit, before we'll obey, before we'll give ourselves to him. It's like, God, do it first and then I'll have faith. You ever said that prayer? Just give me one breakthrough and I'll have faith, Lord. I've said those prayers. God, I just feel like I just need something from you and my faith will be amazing. And I'm like, God's like, hold on a second. Every promise is yes in Christ. I thought he'd already given his son. I thought the cross had already taken place. I thought he'd given us his word. I thought he'd given us his church community. So when we say amen, we align ourselves with his promises. It releases a fresh move of his spirit and his power in our life. God has said yes in Christ. You see, some things are promised to everyone. 
The fruit of the Spirit is a promise that when we are given His Spirit and we walk in His Spirit, joy and peace and self-control, these are promises He gives to all. His salvation He offers to all. Gifts He offers to all. His church He offers to all. But I want to say this today, is that not every single thing you hear is God's promise for you. Just because God does it for one does not mean he has to do it for all. I remember when I was younger, I first become a Christian, and I really needed to get a job. And I went for a job interview at Iceland, right? Not in Iceland, at Iceland. <laughs> I went for a job interview at Iceland. And I tell people, pray for me, I need to get this job, pray for me. And I got all the good Christian responses. The job yours, brother. The job's already yours. God has already given you the job. And I get all, you know, the good Christian response. I can see angels in the interview room with you. God's turning it in your favor. The job's yours, man. I can see you in a red shirt. I can see you stacking. And you get all the, all, the, all the words that Christians are kind of meant to give. Can I just say this on a side note, my own little soapbox? And I always say that. I, don't pre I try my best not to preach my opinion. But you know, we need to be very careful when we keep saying God said. In church, God's, God's telling you, God's telling you, God's telling you, God's telling you. Be very careful. Some people hear God in more in a day than I've heard him in 24 years. Some people, you put a message on a WhatsApp group, a scripture, they're like, God showed me that yesterday. But he's done that every single time. We need to be careful. But then everyone was saying, you've got the job, brother. It's yours, it's yours. What? And then guess what? Didn't get the job. So I'm thinking, well, what happened then? <laughs> what happened? I think I can do the job. What happened? And then that following Sunday, someone I had not told to pray for me came to me. And they said to me, we had a world conference coming up in America. I was 17 years old. Never been out of the country. Never been on a plane. Never been on an airport. Never anything. So it never crossed my mind to think that I could go over to America and be a part of that. And they said, are you going to the conference? And I said, no. They said, have you got a passport? I'll be honest. I said, no, I don't even know what, I don't even know how to get one of them. I'm not sure, not sure I know what it is. And they said, go and get your passport and then come and see me. So I went away, got my passport, came back to that person, thought I felt like I was presenting something to Jesus. Like. <laughs> and they were like, and they slapped the ticket for the World Conference in my hands. <laughs> now, it was at that conference I'm not saying you have to go to America to hear God, but it was at that conference. 24 years ago was the first time I ever came to realization that God wanted to do something great in my life. There's a message by a man named Evie Hill, was a pastor of a church for about 60 years in LA. And he preached about doing something great for God, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. I remember being at that altar at 17 years old and just sensing for the first time, God wants to do something great in my life. Now, this is no disrespect to anyone, but I would have rather that than stacking shelves at Iceland. <laughs> yeah, ain't nothing wrong with that job. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that job, but that's not what God had for me in that moment. Just because God does it for one doesn't mean he has to do it for all in certain areas of your life. But we have to say amen. We have to align ourselves. Our praise aligns us. Our worship aligns aligns us. Studying God's word aligns us. Joining in with the community aligns us. Confession aligns us. Declaration aligns us. Whatever God is promising you, you have to say amen. You align yourself with his promises. This is what Hebrews 13, 8, going back to this passage says. Remember your leaders those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And again, when I sat with this passage, I was like, it just doesn't feel like it's meant to be there. Remember your leaders, consider their faith, imitate them. Oh, and by the way, Jesus Christ doesn't change. To me, when I read it, I was like, it doesn't quite fit in, in my mind. But then I began to realize that no matter what our leaders have achieved before us, 
No matter what we look at, the prophets and the apostles and the kings and the, the church leaders and all of these things, it all boiled down to God honoring their faith, God honoring their obedience, God honoring their sacrifice. And that's why the author of Hebrews finishes with that statement. Look at those that have gone before you. Watch their conduct. Imitate their faith. But know that it is God that blessed them. It's God that honored them. It's God that provided for them. So if faith it, it released the blessing of God in their life, then faith is going to release the blessing of God in your life. If obedience was the key to their victory, obedience is the key to your victory. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means the God of the Exodus is the God that is here in Victory Outreach Manchester. The same spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the grave is the same spirit who lives in you and I, which means when we look at those that have gone before us, when we read the scriptures and we see the victories and the, 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 the transformation that took place, we learn from them, we watch them, we imitate them, but we know it is God who honors the decisions of his people. If he honoured them, he'll honour you. If he rewarded them, he'll reward you. Hebrews 4.2, looking back at the Old Testament, says this. For indeed the good news came to us just as it came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. It might not be the easiest message in the world, but I cannot in all integrity stand up here and say God will do whatever you want him to do. Or that God will do whatever it is that he's told you if you do not say amen to his promises. Who has your amen today? You can't agree with your past and your future at the same time. You can't agree with what labels people put on you and then also agree with the things that God has said over you. God is faithful and unchanging in his presence and in his promises. And lastly, as I finish with this, I said I wouldn't be long today. His presence, his promises, but you know what also remains the same? His power. His power remains the same. But this is why it's in this order. Because when you're in his presence, you become familiar with his promises. And when you become familiar with his promises, you know what you need his power for. A lot of people claiming a lot of things. But when you know what God has promised you, when you know what God has spoke to you, when you come to him in that way, then his power is available and ready to bring about every single promise he has given you. You know, we're about to host a European women's conference. And sometimes when you look back at the, 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 the history of the ministry right here, and this is not the only ministry that has a rich history, there's many that do. But Victory Outreach in 1967, with just one couple that sensed the calling of God, said, you know what, we're going to bring these people into our home. I'm not saying that everyone should do that. It was 1967. And they began to bring people into their home, one drug addict, another drug addict. And before you know it, their house was filled with people they were loving and serving and shepherding and pastoring. And all of a sudden, their families began to come. And all of a sudden, it wasn't just East L.A., it was San Jose, and it was San Bernardino, and then it was all of California, then it was South America. And all of a sudden, we're in South Africa and Panama and Holland and then London and Manchester, and before you know it, there was the power of God that was moving through these churches and these ministries, not because they were so great, but because they had trusted in God's promises. They had spent time in his presence, they had listened to his promises, and they believed for his power. I don't know what part of this process you're at today. I don't know if you say, you know what, today I need to spend time in his presence, man. I've been busy. I've been distracted, I've been worried, and I've not been coming into his presence in the way that I know I should. Today is a day to come before him into his presence and just be with him. 
I'm not going to stand up here and say, God's going to give you a breakthrough. God's going to give you a healing. That's not for me to say right now. But his presence is available for you. I don't know if you need to be reminded of his promises today. Maybe you say, you know what, I've been spending time, man, but, but, but I've been worried, I've been, I've, been, I've been tired. And I say, you know what, I need, I need God's promises again in my heart. I need to, to look upon his faithfulness. I need to know what it is that he wants to do in my life. And maybe today you say, I just want to know his promises again. I want to be reminded of, of what it is that he's promised me in his word and the things that he's spoken over me in my life and my journey today. I believe that God wants to remind you of the things that he's promised you. Or maybe even today you say, you know what, I'm right where I need to be. I really believe that I'm right where I need to be, but I need his power. I need him to quicken some things. I need him to transform some things. I need him to open some doors. I need him to close some doors. It was Elijah's prayers that brought about the rain from heaven. James says, not this James, don't worry about me, James in the Bible, the more important one, he says, earnestly, faithfully, righteously, God opened up the heavens. There are times and moments where we pray and we come before him after being in his presence, after listening to his promises. And there is an outpouring of his power to do what no man can do, to close doors that you need closing, to open doors that you need opening, to quicken things, to accelerate things, to slow you down. His power will bring the enemies down that oppose you. His power, the power that the power that brought about the outpouring of the Spirit, the power that birthed the church, the power that did all these things is the same power that he makes available. But he's not, I believe, and I say this as humbly as possible. And God, forgive me if I say this wrong. He won't entrust his power to someone that spent no time in his presence. He won't entrust his power to just anything you ask for. I'm not saying God doesn't heal. He does. I'm not saying God doesn't uh, provide. He does. But you have to know what it is that God has promised you. That only happens in his presence. I want us to stand to our feet today. This is a very simple medicine-like message. promises that you have given me, the things you have spoken over my life. There are promises in God's word that are for everyone. And there are unique promises that God many times gives us because of a unique calling and purpose he has on our life. I believe there's some of you that need to pick up those promises again. And maybe some of you just simply say, God, I need a miracle. I'm right where I, I believe I'm right where you want me to be. But I can't do this on my own. I didn't come this far to do it in my own strength come this far because you brought me this far and it is your power that I need I want us to lift our hands all across this place for the next few moments just you and him, just begin to speak to him 